everyone, welcome again to the British Boxing Blog podcast. Stephen and Andrew here as always, and we're delighted to be joined by Mr. Michael Conlon. Mick, how are you doing, mate? You good? All good, mate. All good. Not long up, as you can see, we're still wrapped now in Santa pajamas, so just uh, just chilling out. Well, I think we need, to, we need to change that British to Irish over for today. He's do I just need to have the green in orange and just say taking over by an Irish man, you know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe get some new viewers in that, eh? So, you looking pretty chilled out there? Is that um a result of the, the recent injury? Uh no, it's, uh, the injury's recovering well. Um I haven't been able to do too much, but I've been able to get the training. And I was able to actually do a, a dumb first kind of 5K yesterday on the, the outdoor gym machine, which is a kind of machine that takes your body weight and you can run at zero gravity and everything. So I was running at about 80% body weight yesterday uh, on, on the food. So I'm recovering well. Um, I'm hoping to be back very soon. It's pretty mad, wasn't it? Obviously, you put the, you put the footage on... Uh, on on Twitter from the CCTV of the gym and just a total loss of balance and went over on the angle and could you tell straight away? Did you think, oh, shit, this uh, is... Well, so it wasn't even loss of balance. It was just I landed on... So I was stepping over the bench and then the yeah. feet the feet of the bench, the, the leg of the bench, I landed on the edge of it and the foot... I don't buy damage, so... I was just fortunate that... I was warm box. So... Oh, you're grating up a little bit there, Mick. Yeah. I better. I'm sorry, I'm just hit by a fire. Okay. Is that any better, lads? Yeah, it's better, mate. It's better. That's good, eh? So, sorry, what were you saying about the angle and the, and the loss of balance? I saw. I kind of. I was. I was on the. Foot, I was on the bench doing step over the bench. I came down on the foot of the bench and I kind of turned in. Uh, the way I landed on it, it just kind of made my foot turn up like that. And uh, I, I just thought. I thought I snapped it right away. I thought it was. I thought. I thought I'd done worse damage than what I actually done. But I knew. I knew some bad damage. I'm just very fortunate. There's warm boxing boots because if it wasn't warm boxing boots, I think my ankle would have snapped in two. In a bizarre way, was it sort of fortunate that it's happened this year where lots of fighters have missed out and not been maybe as sharp and as active as they'd like to be? You obviously already had one fight this year and there's loads of boxers out there that have only had one fight this year, so it's almost giving you a bit of time to recover and, and get back at it. Yeah, well, if it was any other year, it could be a problem. Um, you know, it could put a, be, be a, bit, a bit of a, a hindrance on, on progression and stuff, but you know, 2020 has been mad for everybody. Um, and a lot of people haven't even got the box. So I'm fortunate that I've got the fight. I'm fortunate that I have a good team still around me. And uh, me not fighting in December doesn't really doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't really change anything. So I'm still uh, I'm still on the right path and it's, it's still not much of a, a problem. Was it frustrating? Obviously, you did have the dog bow fight lined up, and a lot of yeah. people, a lot of people really liked that fight as well. Like it yeah. caught a lot of people's imagination. Uh, that was like the step up for you before the yeah. step up. Do you know what I mean? Is that something yeah. you'd like to revisit again, or is that definitely, most definitely, most definitely? You know, I was, I was one that, you know, as soon as it was put, uh, as soon as it was put to me, I said, to get that fight done, um, and it was kind of put to me by, by. As he himself, um, he says he put some bullshit up saying his next fight's done. Um, just waiting to make a company to send a contract. And I went, <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? But when he said that, I was like, this gets done. Um, let's let's have the fight. I'll, I'll take the fight right now. So, um, oh, Jamie, he says top rank, get it done. And, and you know, it, it seemed like it was done. I don't think everything was saying because money and stuff wasn't agreed, but um, you know it was uh, it was just there. So I was that was the fight I was going to have, and all it was, and I was very very confident in getting and then taking them apart. And was that fight going to be a uh, super bantam off by the way, Mick? Super bantam, super bantam. Thought it, thought it was. So yeah, what was your thinking behind that? You obviously worked your way up at, at Feather to sort of reach the world level, getting. Almost yeah. in line for a title shot. 
Well, like, it's the lockdown, really. Coming out of the lockdown, the first... Sorry, when we went on the lockdown in uh, March, that was the kind of starting point for me in terms of definitely doing it because we've been speaking about it for the last few years. I've been saying for the last few years, you know, I'm, I'm going to move down and stuff, but, you know, I'll be, the way I've been moving and the position I was kind of in, there was like, I was just kind of saying to myself, is it really worth it? It's going to be hard enough um, because I am a big featherweight. I am 5'7". And um, I felt like I was tight enough for the weight, but when lockdown happened, when the first lockdown happened, I just went train. I started to train and really enjoyed myself and was just eating normal. And my yeah, weight yeah. just started to fall down. And I was you like, must be the only person coming out of lockdown later than when you went in. I know, I know. I couldn't believe it. I, could, I couldn't believe it, I'll be honest. I was like, how is this like, just going down? And I was like, later than what I've ever been coming out of lockdown, just naturally and uh, in better shape than I've ever been. So... I was like, I can make 122 in the morning. Adam has been saying it to me for the last two years since it kind of went with Adam. He says, you're a 122 fighter here. You can make 122. And, you know, I think maybe just the lifestyle change and and how it was and how kind of focused lockdown kind of made me. Because if you look at my pro career, it's been nonstop since the first, since the first fight. So, I've been fighting very regularly and uh, I'm making weight regularly. It's It's tough enough to be you know, dropping a lot of weight all the time. Um, but with lockdown, it just kind of normalized my eating patterns and stuff. And I wasn't eating the shit and binging the way I, I probably would after fights. And it just made it very easy for me to, to live normally. And it's stuck with me now. You know, I, I, I'm still on the same eating patterns and, and, and kind of training patterns, which I was on during the, lock, the first lockdown. So, um I thought it was like a blessing in disguise. Is it easy to keep that discipline, Mick? When obviously you know you've done your ankle, you could have sort of just thought, you know, let's enjoy Christmas, let's have a bit of a bit of a binge here. Is it is it easy to keep that discipline, eating wise and sort of training wise, when you're injured? Uh, out of action? I think for some reason I just have no no want no more. I don't I don't want to like I don't eat fast food anyway. Mm. I don't drink. No. Um, you don't get many I, I, I know, I know. I, like I, I just decided, I, I, I did drink now. I'm not, <laughs> not saying I didn't drink, um, but I decided kind of last year, I'll probably have a drink once or twice a year, but I wouldn't say I'm a dr- I, I, I drink because it's, it's that rare. Um, but I just decided kind of two years ago, actually, or la- more last year, that you know, I'd give the drink a knock on the head because boxing's a short career and I want to get the most out of it as I can and, and being clean and, and having a body like a temple really helps that for longevity and stuff so that was it that's what I was doing there but now the, the kind of in lockdown uh, sorry the eating kind of patterns and falling out of routine being injured could easily happen but from that last one I think my whole kind of want and, and hunger type of food is has changed for some reason. I just get up in the morning. I'll probably not have breakfast till about four o'clock or something. Then I'll have my dinner at, ma- at maximum. You know what I mean? It's not like I've no want. I probably eat twice a day at the minute. When, when, when I'm off, I, I eat less. So when I'm in camp, obviously I have all my meals and I eat regularly. But you know, when I'm off, it's like what? I'm not hungry. I'm not training. I'm not burning anything. So it's easy. I guess that's good though. So it's like when you do go into camp, it's not just about cutting weight for the first few weeks. Do you know what I mean? You're you're more or less bang on it, and you can get straight in with Adam and do what you need. That was my problem. That was my problem. My first two, three weeks, maybe four weeks of camp, I couldn't do longer camps because the first while I was just like, let's get this weight down, let's break break the bag of it and stuff. And you know, there was times where I was boxing at one, like my first, my debut and stuff, or my my second fight. My first three fights, I was kind of fighting at 122, and I was living in America, and it was completely different. You know, the food is completely different. Everything is different. Yeah. Plus, I, I was by myself with my, with my missus and my, my daughter. It wasn't like a family or, or, or like you're with the coaches all the time or anything like that, the way I am with Adam. 
Um, so I was just kind of eating what I wanted, and uh, I was going from I was weighing in at one twenty two and going into the ring at one forty six. You know I mean? It was very very easy to shoot up and wait. Um, and you know, if I wanted to do that now, I could do it. But like, there's times I've walked about there or the camp at one one fifty seven. Yeah. And then I had to come in back in the camp and lose all that. So that was always one. Of me. That was always tough. Um, but now I kind of walk around 140, 136, in between that. Yeah, I don't think you'd have the reach for a middleweight to be honest, right, mate? Nah. <laughs> nah. Well, if I'm honest, my reach isn't too bad. Like, I'm, 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 I'm five, foot seven, five foot seven, kind of about seven and a half. Um, and I have a decent enough size for all these middleweights walking around. <laughs> that, that's the tagline of this interview. Yeah. McConnell wants middleweight title shot. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, though, that, that change of outlook must be music to the ears of Adam Booth. You've mentioned that you've yeah. been with him for a couple of years. And you've talked about how full on and active your, your pro career has been so far. That also includes like the trainers you've had. You've had a few, considering you've just had 14 fights. What uh, process at the start of your career? So, how did you choose your initial trainer, and then what's led to the changes since? Um, well, I've only trained with two, um, and two kind of very good trainers. Two trainers are heavyweight champions, um, Manny Robles and uh, Adam Booth. So, um, yeah, listen. The reason I went with Manny was, you know, I says that I was going to start my career in America and, and kind of go to Southern California get that experience of those kind of American, Mexican style fighters who, you know, are, are kind of always around the top of the sport, especially in the later divisions. Um, so, me and Matt Macken, we went over to LA in 2016. What is it? It's a bit background noise. I think it might be from Andrew's side. I don't know. Oh, I can hear it. Oh, it's like wind. Could you mute? I just, I just turned my laptop off. Okay, just cause should be all right. Sorry, Mick. Sorry, continue, mate. Ah, uh, I know. So me and Matt Macklin, we went over to uh, LA. I think it was November time, uh, twenty sixteen. Um, they kind of look for a coach to see who we we're going to work with because it says it was going to go to the America. Um, start out there. That was kind of top ranks plan. Start in America and then kind of gradually go back the 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 home. So. Um, go back to Ireland after that and, uh, and do it the opposite way around where people at home kind of start off at home and then try to make it in America they wanted to make me in America and then bring me back so we've done that there we went over there to train um, we were going to look at a few trainers but went to Manny Robles I seen his gym was thriving um, he had Oscar Valdez he had Jesse Magdaleno and he had loads of other fighters there all over my division um, so I knew to spawn and stuff would be fantastic and uh, we went in train with him. I clicked right away with Manny as a, as a person. First off, um, he's a great guy, a lovely, lovely guy. Um, so down the earth, so kind of humble and stuff. Um, and I really liked him. So I kind of thought it was the right setup for me. The spawn and stuff was perfect. It was a great place to learn, and uh, that's why I kind of started there. I didn't even try any other coaches. You know, we were going to, we went to go and try Friday and stuff, but. I think once I started the train with Manny, I was like, nah, that's that's it. Uh, I'm happy to stay here. You, met, you sort of, well, obviously before we got on Adam Booth, because to me, that's a bit of a match made in heaven. Like your style yeah. and his style must just sort of click, I guess, does it? Is that is that just like... With, with Adam? With Adam, ah, is that just a natural yeah. fit completely? Yeah. Yeah, so that was the reason that I kind of changed. Um, you know, I'd done, the, done a year in LA, um, I kind of realized and learned a lot in terms of the pro game and how and how it is and how they kind of how they fight, um, and I knew that wasn't my actual style. It was just kind of odd and kind of notches the the the, the arsenal I already have. So um, I said I was going to move back to the UK and get closer to my family. Sean was pregnant again with her second baby, and uh, living out in LA. With one kid alone was was tough, okay. um, but with two and me being in training camp the whole time. When I'm in training camp, 
I'll be honest, I'm as useless as a nice tree on a motorbike. You know what I mean? It's like it's pointless. <laughs> it's absolutely pointless me being me being there. So uh we says we'll move back and get more of a support system around us. So we moved back and I says, which coach would I train with? And I says, the only coach I would train with in the UK is Adam Booth. I believe he's the best coach in the UK, if not one of the best in the world. And uh, whether or not <laughs> Adam wanted me to train with him was the question. So um, we went down, done a trial, done a week's trial, and then we were happy to work together. It's mad that you have to do the trial. Do you know what I mean? Even someone of your sort of amateur caliber and stuff and... Is that yeah. just to see if you click? Is that were you like nervous going into that? Is it a bit weird or? It wasn't like it wasn't like a test or anything like that for me. It was just like see just to see if we, see if we clicked, see if the personalities clicked, and yeah. you know what? I, I I really enjoy everything about Adam's setup. You know how Adam is as a person, as a human being. First off, he's, he's a fantastic guy. I, I click with him outside of the ring. Um, we're good friends, but then just his, you know, his philosophy on life, on sport, and everything like that. I love, and then how he trains and how he. Has you your old frozen on mine. Box. What is it? What? I think he said we're frozen, but you haven't on mine anyway. I'm saying you both seem to freeze there, but you come back, mate. That's fine. Yeah, I'm asking. Uh, no, so, all right, all right, so. So how 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 Adam how yeah, Adam yeah. trains and how. Uh, his style of boxing is it really suits me. I think, you know, I, I believe I'm a good box fighter, and that's kind of Adam's style of boxing. Um, someone who uses their brains, hits and not get hit. Because in LA, I seen and I was getting in the wars and sparring all the time, and you know, I I was I was doing really really well. It wasn't that I wasn't doing well or anything. It was that I was seeing guys in the gym who I met in January. They were different in December. Yeah. And that was just an accumulation of punches in spawn. There was just wars. Like they, weren't, they were never trying to learn in spawn. There was never any days where you're going, like, you want to work on this here, work on that there. It's like, you have to go in and win spars. And I don't necessarily think that's the smartest thing to do, <laughs> yeah. especially in a sport where I say you're selling brain cells for a living. So, I was, um, I was talking to someone about this, Mick, the other week, somewhere like a coach up here in the Northeast. And yeah. like, we were talking about Dave Allen and obviously when Dave Allen announced his retirement. And like, I think for us fans, you only sort of see what's in the ring. But he, he touched on like some heavy, heavy spars and like, you know, how are they can just sort of shorten your career and basically shorten your life. And like that, do you know what I mean? It's like these brutal spars, that's something you see. And I've seen a clip of a the boxer online, I won't name him. And he was doing this spar, I think it was out in in Lanzarote somewhere at a gym over there and it was just brutal like and I just thought how can that be good for like fighters and their brains and you know what I mean it's dumb it's dumb um like it's a, it's a real dark say the boxing mm. um not many people notice it people see what goes on in the ring and they see what goes on on social media and and, and, and they kind of have perceptions of fighters who they're going he's a dickhead and he's this and people are probably saying about in the yard lands they can't land the camp. I don't know if he spars or not, but I know I heard before that he didn't really spar any hard spars. For his health, that's fantastic. You know, maybe not for his actual boxing career is it's probably not good, but you know, for his life, his health after the game, that's that's great. <laughs> you know, what I mean? he's taking less damage than any fighter, yeah. but um, he's probably not improving as much as what he should be. But I think there's a, there should be a balance. Um, I don't, I don't, now nah, nah, when I go in the sparring, I go in to work on things. I and I, I go in not to take punches. I'm not, I'm not going in there just that, that let someone land shots at me. If I'm taking shots to sparring, I best just get out of the ring. That's probably what I should do. Uh, I'm not, I'm not silly. Like, I, I use my brain. I'll spar how I fight that. I, I don't get hit in fights. Yeah. So, what's the point of doing it in sparring? I've seen. I've seen fighters, you know, saying like, "I'm willing to take, you know, twenty shots to land one on you and all this." Here, it's dumb. People, boxing, what boxing is, 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 and I always say, it's like, in boxing, you're selling your brain cells for other people's entertainment. How much brain cells are you willing to give for? What's the average paycheck of fighters these days? I, I don't know. Um, like the younger fighters who are in these wars, I say, a lot of them are probably getting five maybe ten maximum um if they're lucky stuff. if they're lucky yeah so um <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's crazy 
is that is it, is that worth getting losing brain cells? I, I, I kind of ever looked at it in that sense. You'd be going, no, it's not. I guess that's Did you ever one. tell your old brother Jamie that, by the way? Yeah, he loved it while Jamie did. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's, that was one of the reasons I told him to fucking pack it in. Yeah. He says, he cannot help but have a war. And it's dumb. It's dumb. Listen, it's great for entertainment. And yes, you go down as a legend, like, you know, Mickey Ward and Arturo Gatti and all, if, if you're doing it the right way and you're winning and all this year. But Let's be honest, Mickey Ward's gonna Mickey Ward's gonna donate his brain to like a medical center when he dies because they're gonna check it and see check it for the CTE or whatever it was called over there and um, yeah, all the trauma. So you know what I mean? That's 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 crazy. That's crazy. You would have to even think of that stuff, and people will be asking, "Can we have your brain when you die?" Because you took so much damage in life. Wow. We want to know why, how you're still alive. You know what I mean? So um, it's scary. It's scary stuff. Here's the side that we don't see. Like I was just just to like finish on that point there. Like when when I was talking about Dave Allen before he announced that retirement, and my initial thought was, God, I hope he doesn't have any regrets and should he have won the English or the British. But then listening to him saying like, I feel like I'm one or two heavy punches away from some like serious sort of damage. I, I was I was delighted when he retired. Yeah, I was delighted. I've met Dave and he was came down for a week with Adam and stuff, and I really clicked with him. Um, I was really hoping he kind of went. And just stay with us and train with us because he's he's great entertainment. But his health and and the punches he's took in life, um, especially in in in, in actual fights, never mind sparring, yeah, yeah. it's scary. It's scary. You know, he has is a chin of granite. But after a while, that just deteriorates because you're just taking too much shots. And uh, when he when he decided to pack it, and I, I actually tweeted it, wrote, wrote underneath his his post saying great decision Dave happy retirement because someone like him you know who's probably loves the sport of boxing yeah is, is just giving his his life to it and it's not giving him anything back um, just do you about, agree then with uh, I was going to say do you, do you agree with Andy Lee's recent comment last night then that sort of fans and people in boxing maybe need to change their outlook on fighters quitting for oh, I see that. I seen that today, uh, and you know what? If you do look at MMA and stuff, the people quit every every fight basically when they're getting tapped out. So, you know, in boxing, it's a brave man's sport, and so is MMA. But like, there's no criticism when someone tops out. Um, the, even like, you know, even in the big fights, when when, when Khabib was choking at McGregor, there's no criticism in tapping out. People are going, that's that's sore. I mean, so when you're getting punched in the head, that's sore. So why doesn't people say there's no criticism? Or I, I do agree with Andy on that. Just going back to you, uh, Mick, in your career, you touched on it before that. Um, you try to do things like differently at the start of your career, like New York, Chicago, Brisbane. I think it was like your seventh or eighth fight when you came back to Belfast. Was that uh, just sort of flipped uh, its head? So something a bit different, like a different sort of strategy, different marketing strategy. Uh, it was it was top ranks idea. Um, yeah. They wanted to the kind of build me around the world, and I think they've done a fantastic job of it. Oh, you know, I have definitely. mad fans in Australia, I have mad fans in Chicago, everywhere. It was like loads yeah. of people coming to watch me everywhere I boxed, and it's still the case now. So, you know, I think they've done a, a great job of kind of building me. Um, yeah, it was it was different. You know, boxing on the packet undercard in in Brisbane, Australia, my third fight. After boxing just a month previous in Chicago, headlining my own show there, it was it was mental. It was a kind of it was a whirlwind, and that's why it was kind of hard for me to stick me on one twenty two because you're going, you're going Chicago, you're going, you know, you're going New York, Chicago, Brisbane, Arizona, and you're non-stop moving, you're non-stop in camp, but in between that there you're living in America and you're trying to get as much <laughs> of the good food in as possible. Yeah. So my way was just going zoop 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 zoop. And uh, <laughs> that's why I kind of decided, listen, fuck it, I'll go to 126 and big enough for it. Madison Square Garden was your second home for a bit, wasn't it? Yeah. It still is, it still is. Most yeah. of my fights have been in the garden. I think over half, or just under half, I've been all in uh, MSG. Um, and that's, in my opinion, it's the greatest, the greatest arena of boxing, the greatest arena in the world. Um, I'm, I'm honoured to be able to box there and, and the people heading head shows there. 
like the greats who have done it in the past. So you know, I'm very, very lucky. I'm very fortunate um, to have that and, and have the connection with, with the people in the garden. And was that pathway something that Top Rank had mapped out to you sort of before you signed? Was that yeah. part of the appeal of joining them? Yeah, yeah. New York, East Coast. Um, they were saying New York, Chicago, Boston. We still box in Boston and... I would love the box in Boston because there's a lot of people there who want to come and see me. Um, but they told me New York would be your home. And one of the main reasons that when you put the contract in front of me now, I was, they told me that my debut would be on St. Patrick's Day in MSG. And I was like, fucking right, I'll have that. I'll take that. No, that's something, that's something people dream of. Like, you know, faders dream of and it never, ever happens. So the fact that I've got to do it, you know, I've done three St. Patrick's Days. It was meant to be four. It would have been four this year, only for the fucking Corona bollocks. Um, so, you know, it's been it's been special. Um, I love it, and there's plenty more to come. You think that's, you think that's what made the um, the Falls Park show in Belfast so spe- so special? Like you hadn't sort of milked the whole Belfast thing. It, you had one fight, you know, but the main fight in Belfast, yeah. that big one. Is that you think that's sort of been around the world? And it's like a homecoming, basically. Do you think that's what made that so special? That's what it is. Every time, every time I box the home net, it's a homecoming because yeah. I'm so used to boxing everywhere else. You know, so when I do get the box at home, it's like it's big. You know what I mean? And and, and you know, a lot of people want to come and see it. But you know, the Belfast one and the Fiala, that was just special. That the whole event, the Fiala itself, that's on every year. And uh, that was feel a 31, I think, I boxed on. That was the 31st year of it. And they came up during the Troubles. They kind of gave the people of, of West Belfast something to celebrate and something to do during all you know, what was going on. So um, the fact that I'm able to go and put on a show like that, at an event that has so much historic kind of stuff for, for the people of my part of the city of West Belfast, um, was special and you know people from all over the world people from all over Ireland England everything came to see it so um, you know it was that was really really special and that's something that'll live in me forever Can you go out in West Belfast without getting mobbed are you a bit of a local celeb certainly I can go out no, it's no problem ever listen you go out and you get people like staring at you going there's, there's my car like, you know what I mean but um, that's no problem it's, 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 it's easy enough for me to go out it's maybe because I'm out so much that you know people aren't big, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's 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 great. Like it's people are just normal, and I am just a normal person from from West Belfast, so I don't think people get too shocked. We must get over to to Belfast for sure. Like it's been on it's been on our list for years to uh, yeah. get over to Belfast for some better. Like I'd, I'd love to do that. And it's so easy as well for Newcastle, man. The flights are so oh. regular. Like, we need to do it. We need to get that sorted next year. I'll get over for the feel. Uh, hopefully, it's August time next year. Hopefully, it's happening. Um, it'd be fantastic. I can't wait for it again. Right, we'll uh, we look into that. Definitely. Go on, Andrew. I'm sure you've got a few questions for for me as well. I could honestly I'd sit here all day and chat, but um, it, one just going back. Obviously, we talked about top rank, top rank, and their um, like the appeal and the attraction to them. How many other promoters did you have offers for when you turned over? Oh, well, there was the likes of Golden Boy and stuff, um, Warren. Yeah, I didn't sit down with Eddie Hearn. Um, he didn't come to me. I think he wanted me to come to them and kind of speak to Evans. But uh, no, I, I, I felt felt that you know, whoever wants me should be coming to me. So, um, yeah, I spoke, I spoke to a few. You know, Richard Schaefer and stuff was on me as well. Um there's a mad story about that uh, when I was in Vegas, Floyd Mayweather and PBC wanted to meet me, but uh, they, part Mayweather promotions or something was was meant to meet me, and like some someone made this rumor up. I was only in Vegas. I was going over to St. Contract with top rank, but I was I, I actually already booked Vegas before the Olympics for me and me and the misses to go and have you know a few a few days. So yeah. when I was actually over, I was able to go and stay my contract with top rank, but. Um, someone made up a story and I was like what the fuck alright I'm not going to say it I'm here but then someone just went and contacted Leonard Ellaby for a statement that he's wrote no comment like, <laughs> alright then no comment from me <laughs> I just I just ran that Mick, Mick Conlon waiting for Floyd Mayweather to come to him 
Oh fuck me! I can't believe it. No, I mean, but he was like, someone says, "Ah, uh, what he's gonna like? He's looking to get Michael Hamlin and stuff." And instead of just going, "No, we're not interested in him," he just said, "No comment." So I'm like, "Sorry, then I'll just say they're interested in me too." Fair play. I bump a couple of zeros on the top right field. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. But um, nah, there was a good few. Um, there was an awful lot of money put on the table, and uh. An awful lot of different kind of things brought in, but for me with top rank, it, it was track record. First off, the path. Secondly, you know the kind of path that they want to have me on, it and the kind of route we wanted to go. Um, where the debut was going to be, and then they came in at the end and blew the rest of the money out as well. So, um, no, I was, I was, I was happy. Um, I know I made the right decision. And even looking back now, I've, I've definitely made the right decision. So, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a good place um, career ways and stuff with, with probably the best promotional setup in boxing. And you mentioned the Olympics there. I was determined to get to with you and not discuss this, but I don't think we can leave it. I'll, I'll, re- I'll rephrase the question a little yes. bit without going into it too much. How important was the nicotine win as a pro for you just to sort of try and put that all to bed? You know what? I was confident to beat him. I knew I beat him already. Beat him. I beat him in the Olympics, handy. I thought, and I knew the pros would be the same. He hadn't impressed me as a pro. It was just, you know, top rank wanted to do it, and then like I was past. And once it says, once the fight was off the first time, I was like, it's done. Listen, move on. It's too far behind now. But this is like it in December. I says, okay, do it. I'll get it done, and we'll just move on. So it was important, but. <laughs> When I look back on, on everything that happened, I'm glad it happened. Um, there's days where I'll look back and I'll be pissed off that it happened, but you know, at the minute, sitting here this morning, I'm, I'm happy it's happened because I'm in the position I'm in now because of it. Do you want to talk about Gamora yet then? Let's get down to business. Gamora. <laughs> what about John? Josh Kelly? Let's speak about Josh Kelly. He's from the North East. He's from the North East. Like, I mean, Does he guys, he's looking phenomenal into the gym. Looking phenomenal. I'm telling you, he fights David Avanesi in the end of January, I think. And you're going to see a, a special performance from that man. Yeah, we'll have to get him on. He's a, he's a quite a talented lad, isn't he? Yeah. Unreal. Unreal. Yeah. I'm telling you, in the gym, he, he's he's in a different kind of mindset at the minute. And, uh, and I think you're going to see the best of him. Uh, I think you're going to see a star being born uh, for UK boxing on, I think it's the January 30th show. It's definitely the fight that like, potentially, as you say, it's going to be that could be that breakout performance. He, he yeah. beats Evan Essien comfortably, and then he gets a lot of attention, doesn't he, from the, the boxing press and uh, media? And... Honestly, I think he absolutely destroys Evan Essien, and that's just going off what he's doing in the gym at the event, and how he's looking, and how he's training, and how his mindset is. He's, he's looking unbelievable. Um, better than I've ever seen him, more focused than I've ever seen him, and I think they're going to see a big performance. Was there any truth in the rumours that he was? Going to be moving up in weight. No, no, he's he's making weight comfortable. Good, uh, good night for Harlem Eubank as well the other night. Another someone that you know. Fantastic! Was. Did you see me in the corner? Yeah, work, work, work on the magic. No, no, no. He just me nowadays. All down to you, eh? Was it? Was that? Uh... <laughs> nah, Charlie Beat, Charlie Beat, Adam Booth, and uh, uh, and Hitch have done a fantastic job of um, the improvements on Harlem over the last two years, and, and I haven't stopped saying this. Have been unbelievable. He's a really, really good fighter. Someone who's learning every day and wants to learn every day and is always trying to improve. I think we haven't even seen half of what he's going to be able to achieve. I think he's just going to keep improving, improving, improving. I think the sky's the limit for him. Even the improvements from the McDonough fight was, was big. But the improvements, remember when he boxed in Monte Carlo a few years ago? The improvements, yep. that's like night and day, that. that I couldn't believe, like, yeah. I'm so good at like, so, but, so, like, even, like, I... I looked at that, so I wasn't with Adam and stuff when, when Harlem had had that fight and, and I heard about it, I didn't watch it, I've never watched it, still haven't watched it now because it's irrelevant, but I looked at the opponent, go and look at his record when Harlem fought him in his second fight, remember Harlem hasn't had much amateur experience at all, yeah. and he's went and fought this kid who's just after beating a 17-0 and kid, or 17 and, uh, 17-0 one draw kid, and then he draw with your man Reynold Garrido. Who is a is a nightmare for everybody he fights. Um, 
Uh, the guy, the guy, the guy who who he fought with and got he got he obviously got the decision against him in Monaco, but apparently it was a really close fight. He was a hard fight for for a, 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 a second fight for anyone, but never mind someone who's never had a, that much amateur experience at all. So, um, I think it's really impressive that he came through and, and improved so much. And I was so happy. I spoke to Kevin Lilly, who was Danny Darko's coach before the fight. And I was having a wee bit of back and forth of him. And uh, he mentioned that fight. And I just said, I'm so happy you're looking at that fight. I'm so happy you're looking at that fight. You're not going to learn anything from that fight. I'm delighted. You take everything you want from that fight. You're not going to learn anything. And then after, I says, I told you so. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it was, it's, he's, he's a, great, a great guy, Harlem. Um, improving all the time. And I think you're going to, you're going to see a lot more from that. You mentioned obviously you were, you were in the call and stuff. Uh, and you mentioned before that boxing is a short career. And do you have a do you have a plan for for life after boxing, Mick? Do you think you you look that far ahead? Do you, do you think you stay in the game in some way or? or no, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. That was the first time I've done a a pro corner. I've done a few amateur corners, but, but and obviously I was just the second. Yeah. It was Charlie. Charlie was the man on the corner. But I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. I didn't think it was enjoyed as much. I loved it. I loved it. You know, you're in there. I felt after I felt like I had just boxed. You know what I mean? It was just like I was buzzing. And I actually enjoyed that feeling without actually having the fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was actually nice. Um, but I don't know. Listen. What about James? I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'll, I'll still be involved in boxing after boxing. Not like Jamie? You wouldn't want to go to wear a suit and do the old... You know, the oh. you know, that could that could that could uh nine or five. That could be a that could be a that could be a, an avenue I'd probably go down. I would consider going down, but I don't think it could be a coach. Yeah, I don't think coaches are appreciated enough. I think you know there's some of the most unappreciated people in boxing, and there's no there's <laughs> there's no contracts for a coach. Is there really? Like you know, when you're coaching someone, you don't really have a contract. So some guy could train with you for six weeks. And then go, you know what, fuck you, I don't even train me. I'm going to go and train with this guy for the rest of the, rest of the camp and finish off and pay him. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's a bit, it's a bit unfair on coaches at times. And I don't think they get the, the appreciation because at, this, at, say at the end of the day, they're spending 12 weeks of their life, you know, training someone. It's funny, you know, like, like, obviously, speaking of coaches, it sort of brings me full circle to like last night in Anthony Yard, Lyndon Arthur, and like, yeah. Someone messaged me like on Twitter. I was like, oh, that whole lines in the camp thing, I just can't get my head around. But it's hard to like go in on a coach because obviously, say if we're up here, like we're close to, for example, Ritson, right? And you know, yeah. when Fort Vasquez last time, and then a lot of people go straight for the coach, don't they? Oh, he needs to leave his coach, he needs to do this. And we, we sort of try and defend that. So it's hard yeah. to go straight in and like. Last night, even though, as I say, the whole lines in the camp thing, usually a bit confused. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I understand that completely. Uh, and there is times where you know the coach makes obvious mistakes. Mm. But how much times have they not made mistakes? How much times have they done things right? But they'll always be cr- criticised for the mistake. So, what did you um, make last night? What did they make of the fight last night? No, I thought I thought Arthur won comfortably. So, yeah. Put him uncomfortably behind behind the job with one like, hand, yeah. With one hand, like it looked like if I'm honest, on the yard didn't know how to pass his job, he didn't know how to just kind of break off the job, roll inside, and work from the inside. He looked like he didn't believe in his gas tank, you know, at the end. He but he put it on him at the end. You know, have you done that earlier? I yeah. think it would have been completely different. Why leave but it? Yeah. Arthur won a bad job. Uh, it was a beautiful job, fantastic job, unpredictable from from shooting from the hip, and it was just so it, it was too easy. Like on the art was standing in front of him doing all this movement stuff, but he didn't know. I don't think he even understood why he was doing it. Do you think the last two weeks, you know, Joe Joyce and Lyndon Arthur have just sort of demonstrated the importance of a, of a job, really, and of that sort of yeah. reason in it as well. But the fundamentals, you know what I mean? Like, that, that basic... It's fundamentals, basic stuff. And, you, you know, listen, Daniel Dubois has a fantastic job, but Joe Joyce just took it away from him. Uh, so that was obviously just a bit of 
his own skill and his own kind of awkward has done that there. Um, with Yard and Arthur, the fundamentals, the amateur pedigree kind of shone through in that one, I think. Um, just pinging the job and keeping distance where, you know, you needed a coach to say, you're not winning these rounds. It's not lands in the camp. It's put your fucking foot in the gas and go and take this guy out. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can't just win a fight by saying lands in the camp or whatever. He was sitting in the corner and didn't even, didn't even listen. I was playing Call of Duty when I was watching it. So, um, you love Call of Duty, yeah. I love it. I love it, mate. But, uh, like, I think that there wasn't enough urgency. I was I was still listening, but it wasn't there wasn't enough urgency in Yard's corner. And I think how he reacted after and how he believed he won after, that's yeah, that's the kind of fault of having so much yes men around you. Yeah. Absolutely. You need to have a good look of, of who is surrounding them. And I think people have been saying this for a long time. A long time. Um, even after the Kovalev fit, listen, he done well. He hurt Kovalev. I think that took away from what was actually going on and what actually happened in the corner. It didn't seem like there was anything going on in these corners. Um, so I think he needs to kind of go back and look at his setup. I don't think he, he will, but I think he needs to. Um, I don't think he'll listen to anybody else. I think you know, maybe his his ego and his arrogance might just take away from what he needs to do to fix it. I think he needs to kind of reassess everything and uh, take a good hard look in the mirror and ask himself, does he really believe he won that? That's exactly what I was trying to say on Twitter, but I think you've just said it better than I ever could. It's it's exactly that, isn't it? It's it's the yes man. It's he'll probably go backstage after that and people will be going, Yeah, Robbery, you won that fight and he's like, Yeah, I won that fight and where where do you stop? Like where do you cut the where do you cut the cycle? Do you know what I mean? Like, someone needs to tell us Where did the learning come in? Like where did he yeah. learn from that if he didn't think he's done anything wrong? Yeah, they 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 won't they won't learn if if that's the attitude they have. Um, I hope I really do for his own sake. I have nothing against any fighter, um, because when they get into the ring, yeah, you know they're they're putting it all on the line. Uh, and uh, if I'm honest, there's times in there where it is late for death. So, you know, they they've got to do what they've got to do to win. But I think he really needs to have a good hard look at himself and ask himself hard questions and he'll need to answer them if he really wants to go far in the sport he has obviously has plenty of ability he just needs to kind of fix things up and change things around and, and then start moving forward again but another thing which has annoyed me you know two weeks in a row BT haven't give the winner enough credit yeah. you know and yeah they, he's uh, jumped interviews after, immediately afterwards both fighters getting interviewed and talking over the top which of them they both, both have been upset where well, I knew I knew fucking Joe Joyce was going to win I've been saying it from January when the fight was first made it wasn't an upset for me but like they were like obviously so surprised everyone was so surprised but like come on give Joe credits for going in and implementing the game plan and winning comfortably um, at the end when he stopped him so that's comfortable when you stop someone it's a comfortable win um, but then Arthur or sorry Arthur last night he won comfortably in my eyes I don't know who you had it 117-111 that was fucking crazy um, Lewis, I believe. that's what give me some of that fucking, give me some of that fucking gear you're smoking man that's crazy that's crazy shit and you know Arthur stood there after complete professional very humble, very honest, you know, saying, listen, I couldn't get my right hand off. He hurt me here. He just being honest, whereas, you know, what yards did there throwing the toys at the pram. Well, I didn't do this. Aren't do you think you won? Give the, man, give the man who won the credit, and that's where it should be. Great, totally agree. Bang on, bang on. Um, just going back to you, Mick, to sort of finish um, 2021, big year, hopefully all this COVID thing dies down and stuff, and, you know, you're back yep. to full fitness and that. Um, if we were to speak to you, say in a year, December twenty twenty one, where would you like to be? How I'll be you... world champion. I'll be world champion one hundred percent by then. One hundred percent. And that's just the all start. being well. All being well, had my health ways with my injuries and so it was my first injury ever. Yeah. All being well than that, I'll be world champion very very soon. Hope so, mate. Hope so. Honestly, massively appreciate it, and thanks for giving us your Sunday morning and stuff. Uh, been a pleasure, Mick. Thank you very much, mate. Cheers. Chris, Chris, yeah.
Come over, yes. Uh, stack the card, back the card. Oh, yes, uh, I guess the last season of Come over, Mick. Final series. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. What's going to happen now with all this fucking coronavirus? Is fucking putting it off. How did they do it? I don't know. It's unbelievable. What a show. Best show on TV by males, by, by absolute males. Like, I, like my missus, I've been telling my missus, you need to watch this, you need to watch it. It's like, I don't want to watch it. It's not something I'd be into. So she watched the first season with me. Yeah. She thought it was kind of a wee bit slow, but towards the end, she was like, right, what's the next one? I went away to camp, started camp, kind of start of October. I came back and she had finished it. Yeah, really? It's amazing. It's what? I think she finished it within two weeks. I think she watched the three more episodes, three more series within two weeks. She loved it. Honestly, I say, I say, I say, after watching it, I can't really watch another TV show. Yeah, oh, it's so good, man. It's so good. Because of here, Andrew, he speaks Italian. He doesn't even need the subtitles. He needs to watch it. Tell him to watch it. All right. I'll take the recommendation. Andrew. Fuck off, man! Come on, why are you doing? It's not a recommendation. You need to go in and watch it. Don't don't say take a recommendation. Just go and watch it. You're missing out. I'm I'll, I'll, I'll load it up now. Best watch- show on TV. Best watch- show on TV yeah. by Mates. Did you watch Limitale as well? Did you see that one? Ah, ah, Brent. It got me. It got me excited for the next one. Makes you miss it, doesn't it? I definitely. Uh, you follow him on Twitter, Salvatore Espinosa. Ah, follow, 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 follow. Sorry, on Instagram. On Instagram. Uh, I, 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 I tweeted something about Gamora before or, or was wrote it on Instagram when I had an official Instagram page and they were messaging me back and all I was like, get me in the show. Get me in the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the- be an extra. Uh, 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 thanks, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, take- right, cheers, mate. Right, lads. Take care. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.